a real, real pleasure to see everybody here tonight, um, especially at the end of this particular week. Um, people kept saying, like, you couldn't have timed it better. And I was like, well, I didn't need it to be timed quite so perfectly. <laughs> Um, I hope everyone was able to join us uh, for some drinks uh, before the show. Um, I, I didn't partake myself, I'll, I'll say that, because um, last weekend I got age inappropriately drunk. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say what age, but it was inappropriate. Um, and I thought, I thought it was fine. I, th I thought I'd pulled it off uh, until I received an email the next morning, subject line, last night. <sighs> Whatever you're thinking, it's way worse. Um, <laughs> the email said, hey, great chatting with you at that party. Here's the link to my travel blog <laughs> that you asked to read. <laughs> Let me know if you do think it has memoir potential. <laughs> it's like, oof, you, you really have to drink responsibly. Um, be careful with people's self-esteem. Um, you know, that is, that is certainly one of the pleasures of my work, um, getting to introduce a new voices to broader audiences. Um, I'm the editor of the Sunday Review section here, as Beth said. Um, and sometimes, thanks, sometimes when I, when I tell people that, um, instead of like a small smattering of applause, they'll say, um, <laughs> they'll say, that's a big job. And I say, I'm a big lady. Because um, I want them to know that's like not a compliment. Um, <laughs> but you know, I'll be honest. The, the two things are not unrelated. Like it has been my experience that stress eating is a very appropriate way <laughs> to <laughs> respond to to the present moment. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting time, um, I think, for all of us. All of us engaged in journalism, interested in the kinds of stories we're going to tell, and and what's going to make journalism feel urgent and important. Um, I remember like not that many years ago, I was working in a different newspaper and we had a meeting, like how are we gonna keep young readers engaged? How are they gonna know journalism is important? And the answer we came up with then was Snapchat. <laughs> we didn't know the answer could just be being alive in the world in 2018. <laughs> it's a really different approach. Um, I found myself, um, well, you, part of what makes this evening so special, I think, is I found myself really relying on the wisdom of women, the wisdom of the, the brilliant women's voices who you're gonna hear tonight. Uh, we have here Caitlin Greenidge, Maeve Higgins, and Lindy West. I'm here for them. Um, just a few of the contributors. Um, I'm really honored to get to publish here at the Times. And I, I seek sort of the wisdom of women in a lot of ways in, in um, group text with like always the perfectly timed emoji. And um, also just like eavesdropping on women. I've been trying to um, like, dress a little bit better in my life, feel a little more confident. It's a work in progress. Um, and I was eavesdropping the other day on these two very stylish women who were discussing a, a new dress that one of them was going to buy. And her friend said to her, well, you could go with the smaller polka dot, because then you'll still get the benefit of the polka dot. <laughs> and I was like, what is the benefit of the polka dot? Like, camouflage a twister? I don't know. Like, I was like, is that something that skinny women's mothers teach them? Like, all my mom said was like, well, you have a metabolism that would have served you well during the long winters in the old country. Good luck at high school in the 90s. <laughs> Which, in retrospect, I needed, but not as much as I might have needed at high school in the 80s, we have learned this week. Um, my mother is, is full is full of um, is full of advice. She communicates with a lot of it uh, via text message. She was a late adopter, but but very enthusiastic. And um, like a few years ago, th this moment we're in has like changed our text relationship too. A few years ago, what I got from her was like a pretty steady stream of updates on the lives of her friends' daughters, just like their engagements, their weddings, their babies, like a very very subtle. Um, <laughs> And now what I get is just like a pretty steady stream of updates on Rachel Maddow's life. <laughs> so that has been a net positive, <laughs> I would say. Um, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased that you've decided to join us tonight for this new experiment, a combination of opinion journalism and comedy. Um, I will admit I'm approaching it with a little bit of trepidation. The last time I tried to combine comedy and journalism in my life 
was in early 2012 when I competed in DC's Funniest Journalist competition. <laughs> it, was a, it was a different time. <laughs> uh, part, <laughs> yeah. um, part of uh, what I was talking about on stage at that time was um, Zumba. For those of you who don't know, Zumba is just like a really fun combination of Latin dance and abject humiliation. Um, <laughs> And what I chose to do in a room about this size full of my colleagues and peers and the judges was to do, do Zumba choreography, like, <laughs> directly at the judges. And um, one of the judges that night was Eleanor Holmes Norton, of course, DC's non-voting delegate to the House of Representatives. She had a vote that night. <laughs> I didn't get it. Um, so really, we're all here together tonight on a, on a journey of, um, like, to avenge that, <laughs> that near loss. Uh, and just a time to, to be together um, in this wonderful company, in this wonderful room, to hear some brilliant women tell you some stories that they thought you'd like to hear in this moment. Um, it's my great honor to introduce our first performer. Uh, Caitlin Greenidge is a novelist and contributing opinion writer to the New York Times. She's written on such things as her parakeet and <laughs> cultural appropriation. Um, so it's a, it's a range that I greatly, greatly admire. Um, her novel is We Love You, Charlie Freeman, and she's here tonight to tell you a story. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy the evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so I'm going to read from, uh, it's like a mashup of two pieces that um, have been in the uh, opinion section before. Um, and so this is a description of sort of two different road trips that I have taken over summers past um, with my two sisters and my mother. I do not know how to drive. My middle sister, Carrie, learned to drive a few years ago. We are both well into adulthood, but I still rely on her and our oldest sister, Kirsten, for any sort of transportation outside of New York City. But over the past few summers, my sisters and I, sometimes with spouses and our mom in tow, have been on a road trip to women's history sites, and on these trips I have found myself in the slightly disempowering backseat while on a search for empowerment. The road trips are supposed to answer the following questions. What does the rallying cry of sisterhood and the concept of feminism mean when in 2016 the majority of white female voters chose whiteness as a political identity over womanhood? What does feminism mean when you can buy a the future is female t-shirt at Target? Is our uh, trust in women a belief in a new order or simply the desire to see a female face at the head of the institutions that harm so many of us? But before I get into those uh, really heavy questions, I should tell you um, who was in the car with me. One of the occupants was my sister, Carrie. I idolized Carrie growing up, and I still do. When she was a teenager and I was still in middle school, she wore high-rise short shorts and tube tops, and she was the living embodiment of the song, Shoop, strutting down the halls of our super white prep school. She also played cello, loved Pushkin, and read and wrote obsessively. She was that thing too much of America fears and ridicules, the loud black teenage girl. And now she's an academic, bumping vintage D'Angelo in her hybrid car as she pulls into her university parking space. My sister Kirsten, my oldest sister, um, taught me the importance of work for women. There is the seductive, unattain unattainable fantasy of a room of one's own, and then there is the reality of the life of a working mother and artist, which she lived in front of me. Revising your work and responding to students and drafting grant applications from the front seat of your car while your kids are in dance practice. Um, the three of us have always been sort of in this car driving together. Uh, when I was 16, my two sisters, my mother and I drove from our home in Massachusetts to Iowa in a U-Haul with no air conditioning. Um, we were driving to take Kirsten to grad school because we were all very codependent and couldn't let her go alone. <laughs> Before we left, my mother, in her best therapist way, my mother's a therapist, she's a social worker, 
She asked each of us to list the one thing we needed on the trip to be comfortable. And she believed this would cut down on conflict. So she was trying to kind of get ahead of having three uh, teenage girls in a car. Kirsten said blankets, because even in a truck's cab without air conditioning in August, she would be cold. I said hotels with pools, which is, it's easy enough to research today, but this was in the late 1990s before you could figure such a thing out with a few clicks online. And so my mother dutifully took out her map from AAA and a guidebook to the Midwest and a pink highlighter and plotted each stop to align with a budget hotel with a pool of some sort. My middle sister Carrie said, all I want is breakfast, by which she meant a sit-down breakfast every single morning with bacon, eggs, and at least two bread options, no matter, where we were, no matter what time we were supposed to get on the road. And my mother, in the interest of fairness, agreed. The summer of this road trip, I had just finished my junior year of high school, and I was slowly coming to the realization, at a later stage than most, that I was separate from my family. The coming year would be the first one when I was the only sibling at home, a terrifying prospect for a family as close as ours. We all spent weekends, still spent weekends together, as we had since we were children. In the gossipy cocoon of my mother's shabby gold Toyota Corolla was a glorious place to be, with a language all of its own. A single word, mango, donkey, said with the correct inflection could make us all dissolve into historical laughter. I should say, those are um, code words for dick jokes, which I'm very proud that I s <laughs> slipped into the New York Times on Sunday, last Sunday. Um, <clears throat> the trip broke apart early on, though, when we reached upstate New York. Our U-Haul became ensnared in a miles-long traffic jam. We kept trying to get off and check into a hotel to avoid the worst of it, but every hotel for miles around was booked. If we can just make it to Schenectady, my mother said. Schenectady? Schenectady. Is that the sign for Schenectady? This was a refrain for what felt like miles until I yelled from the back jumper seat, stop saying Schenectady. <laughs> there was a shocked, stunned silence, and then worse, peals of laughter. You don't like that word? Caitlin doesn't like that word? What's so bad about Schenectady? Inside that car, despite that very, very tight closeness, my sisters taught me how to be a feminist. They taught me in their contradictions and the fact that they contain multitudes. My family is black in Northeastern America, which means our economic and social success was dependent on fleeing as far away from predominantly black neighborhoods and schools as possible. So my upwardly mobile parents moved us to a predominantly white neighborhood, and I always went to predominantly white schools. My best friend was a little white girl who lived next door. Her mother loves to tell the story. After playing at our house, she begged her mother for a Barbie, and on Christmas morning, my best friend opened her present and burst into tears. This is not Barbie, she sobbed. She held up the white, blonde Barbie in its box. Barbie has brown skin. She has black, curly hair. This is not the Barbie at Caitlin's house. The art, the art historian Amoyo Akedishi notes that in Yoruban concepts of history, the community must assure children that they are not physically alone, and that a series of roadmaps exist made by great and talented ancestors who as individuals have beaten a track for succeeding generations. This is why history is a comfort for, to me in times of doubt, and this is of course why the past is a battleground why we fight about statues and which systems of oppression should be enshrined in bronze to be remembered or turned down to be recorded differently. I've seen firsthand how understanding history can change people's present day attitudes. A decade ago in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, I led a group of black high school students on a tour of the Hunterfly Road houses in Weeksville, Brooklyn. I told them the story of black self-determination and liberation in 19th century Brooklyn, and by the end, these students literally broke into song a spontaneous rendition about freedom and joy and black excellence, and it was one of the most profound moments of my life. So on our history road trip, which we took part two of this summer, my sisters and I were chasing something like that feeling, and we wanted to find women who could remind us that another, more tolerant, hopeful way of being is possible. Our first stop was the Prudence Crandall Museum, a wide Federalist-style building in Canterbury, Connecticut. In 1831, Crandall, a young white woman, opened a school in the building for the daughters of the wealthy white families in town, and it was a success. The, ex the next year, Sarah Harris, a 20-year-old black woman, wrote to Crandall, 
Harris hoped to eventually open a school for black children in Connecticut, and she wrote, quote, Miss Crandall, I want to get a little more learning, if possible, enough to teach colored children, and if you will admit me to your school, I shall ever be under greatest obligation to you. If you think it will be the means of injuring you, I will not insist on the favor. I think about this letter, the carefulness of the words. It's a tone that I recognize that I think most people who have ever worked under oppression recognize. It's the tone you adopt when you are unsure if the person you are talking to has the ability to see you as a fellow human. Um, actually, Prudence Crandall did admit uh, um, Harris into the school, uh, and the white parents revolted. Um, they took all of their children out of the school. The school became a school for um, black women. Uh, the town burnt the school down. Uh, and uh, Crandall actually, um, I think she's, if I'm remembering the story correctly, she spent time in jail. She's now a Connecticut State heroine. You can go see the school. Um, that county is also home to uh, a kind of a white supremacist South, though, so be careful. Um, I think about this letter. Oh, sorry, right, right, right. The museum has a section dedicated to the stories of the women who studied there. And my sister Carrie, her history nerd that she is, recognizes all the names on the wall as though they are old friends. Um, this summer, we took part two of our feminist road trip to upstate New York. And as the signs approached, my middle sister began to smile. Remember Schenectady, she said. And I said, of course. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I love that story of Caitlin's because it makes me um, like very nostalgic for tr family road trips, which I had a very formative one. Um, in my family, we, when I was uh, 13, my family and I drove from Vermont, where we were living, to, to California, where we were moving. And um, when I was about half, we were about halfway across the country, I was just like very impatient with everything, especially my father, mostly. Just like the way he was applying sunscreen, and the way he was breathing, <laughs> it was all wrong. And this was in the 90s, so we, we got to our destination for the day, and he was gonna bring with him two different maps and a guidebook, and I said, Dad, if you bring all those things with you, everyone will know we're tourists. <laughs> um, we, we were at Mount Rushmore that day. <laughs> yeah, ev everyone at Mount Rushmore is a tourist. If, if you're not a tourist at Mount Rushmore, you're the Lakota Sioux, just <laughs> coming to reclaim what's yours. Um, we were Jews from Vermont. That's a different tribe. Um, but um, it is a cherished memory, that road trip. Um, I'm so excited to bring this next performer to the stage. Um, Maeve Higgins is a comedian and writer. You can keep clapping for her. I just want you to know that um, she just released a brilliant book of essays called Maeve in America that I highly encourage you to treat yourself to. Please welcome Maeve Higgins. It's so nice to see you. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, I I like do I do writing, but I also do do um, you know whatever this is <laughs> talking to crowds of people. But um, so I said to Rachel like whatever I'll do this. But um, <laughs> it's so fun, and I said I should tell them about myself. Blah blah like, and I'm because first of all you have to get used to my accent because I'm from Kansas and or no. <laughs> Big, big sky country, <laughs> or no, Lone Star, Kansas, or I don't know. Um, oh, where the peaches are so heavy on the tree, or I don't know. Um, no, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm Irish. I actually came over, I arrived here five years ago. I left from the same town, which is called, is anybody else here Irish? You are? Hi. Anyone else? No, I'm going to put the lights on now and I'll identify you by your tiny little mouths. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, are you like born in Ireland? You know, like, oh, you are. Oh, yeah. Um, and do you know them behind you? <laughs> I bet you do. I bet if you two talked for long enough, you'd find a connection. <laughs> One degree of separation, exactly. And that's Protestants, Catholics. <laughs> Um, but I <laughs> so yeah, I uh, I came over here. I'm from a place called Cove, and 
it's the last place that Titanic left from before it, I don't want to ruin the end of that movie if you haven't seen that movie. It's a beautiful film, very sad. And um, that's also the, the place that Annie Moore left. Do you guys know who Annie Moore is? Oh, you do? She's here with us tonight. No, she's not. Um, <laughs> who, who's Annie Moore? Exactly, yeah. Um, wow, you don't even need a mic. <laughs> um, she was, indeed. She came over, I think it was in 1897. I wrote about this, but I can't. 1892, right. And, uh, all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and she, um, you know, she was an undocumented, like, m a minor. And she came over with her two little brothers who were even younger than her. And the three of them came over and were welcomed with open arms. They even got, like, a, she got, like, a, a little piece of money, like a ten, ten dollars or something. And, uh, and then she moved. She didn't really move. She just, like, went into the Lower East Side and lived there for the rest of her life. But um, I think about her now all the time when I hear these stories of like kids coming to the border and, um, and, and us taking them away from their parents because she actually was reunited with her parents when she got to America. And, they, uh, and then she married a German. So, uh, and he was a baker. Isn't that the dream? <laughs> that is such, oh my God. Um, so yeah, so I do think about her. Um, so I, when I moved here, you know, there's some things that I think are kind of like shocking when you're an immigrant here. Things that you don't know that you don't know. Like when, um, you know, the, the toilets, the stalls here have, there's a gap in them. I get a lot of different answers as to why that is. But like, do you know how there's like an, almost an inch gap between the door and the door frame? And then, you know, I got off the flight at JFK and, and I went to use the bathroom and then I just, you just like tilt your head to the side. There's just this like vertical cross section of a shilling woman. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry to look you in the eyes, but I didn't know. Um, <laughs> why is that? Do you know why that is? Does anyone know why that is? No? What? Ventilation? No, it's not ventilation. <laughs> this, this one girl was like, so you don't commit suicide in the... I was like, no, I don't... Um, there's a whole range of answers. I think it's just, I don't know, it's a quirk. It's a quirk of American society. Slavery or, you know, um, all these different little experiments. So, um, and then the other, you know, the other thing is like, I know the subway doesn't work, but I still use it. <laughs> and um, isn't it fascinating down there how we keep trying to use it? <laughs> <laughs> like, we know, but we're like, well, I do have this Metro card. <laughs> I'm just going to give it one more go. Um, and uh, Miranda's not going to fix it now, so... So I was, um, it's a stressful scenario down there, isn't it? Like, even if it was functioning, uh, it's like tough because everyone's crowded together and, you know, the infrastructure is crumbling around us and uh, it, everyone's stressed. And like, I noticed I was on the, well, I was waiting for the G for a really long time. Have you ever seen the G? <laughs> <laughs> I heard tell. And this is like me doing jokes in the 1970s, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and I was waiting for it, and then I, you know, it, it, it took a long time, whatever, I got on the train, and then like uh, I saw a toddler missing the train. And even he was so full of stress. Like, he like ran down the steps, like his mother was like way behind, and uh, I just saw his little face, like, you know, the window was there, and his eyes just came up, and they were just enraged. <laughs> And I was like, you're four years old. Where, where do you need to be? Like, what do you, you know? But he was, oh. And I, uh, like, threw his sippy cup down. It was like black coffee spilled out everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, there's believers. Like, we live here for a reason, don't we, in New York? Like, there's still, like, we still talk it up. Like, it's so funny. I, uh, 
I was saying to my friend, like, you know, it was the summer. I think, you know, we just, we're just out of the summer. There's, you know, it's a horrible time at the moment. What with the Handmaid's Tale coming to life. But <laughs> at least the summer's over. <laughs> huh? We'll be so comfortable in our hoods now. <laughs> I hate the... <laughs> I hate this. I like covering up. Um, but uh, I actually want to have a chat. No. <laughs> um, I, you know, I hate the summer and I, you know, it always arrives like with such ferocity and it surprises me every day. I've been here now for five summers. And, uh, you know, it's like the first day when suddenly you're boiling and sweating and your clothes are clinging to you. And, and I always think like, shit, it's here, you know, it's too late to work out. Ugh. Like, <laughs> this is the body I'm in. <laughs> and uh, I work in a, like a shared office space, you know, because I, uh, not because I want to, but you know. And, uh, and I uh, went in there and I said to the, like one of my coworkers in there, I was like, oh man, like this, this is the, you know, worst thing about being white, like this hot summer. And you know, he's a black guy and he was like, yeah, I believe you. <laughs> I was like, no, oh, you got me there. Yeah. I was like, but look at my heat rash. And he was like, that's inappropriate workplace. You know, <laughs> the whole long thing. Anyway, I don't, I'm not allowed to go in that building. But um, anymore. But um, yeah, like I think my friend Mindy was saying like how great it was. She was like, you know, oh, the, you know, the great thing about New York in the summer is you can get the subway to the beach. And I was like, that to my ears is the nightmare to the bigger nightmare to the, <laughs> The sleeping nightmare when you like wake up, but then it's another nightmare. <laughs> You're in like a <laughs> whirling dervish of nightmares. Um, so yeah, I don't like the beach either. I mean, I like the beach in my country. Um, in Ireland, you know, you guys know what the beach is like in Ireland. There's no sand or sun or uh, it's just sort of like gray, sharp gray stones. So you have to have your shoes on and you have to have like a shawl on around your head and, and I look magnificent like I stand there and drizzle and rain and <laughs> I have these like sad eyes I scan the water. <laughs> Will he come home? <laughs> That's what suits me. So I believe my um, time is up. I said to Rachel, I said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and make them laugh and then it will peter out at the end. <laughs> and, you know, it was great to have that plan. To me, it feels like that plan really worked. <laughs> and I, <laughs> you can have a nice <laughs> little lull now. And um, I also want to thank Rachel for putting this together. I read Lindy's work. I love Caitlin's work, her novel. But um, I never see them, you know. Sometimes we share the pages, but I, I never get to see them. They keep us separated, the patriarchy. Um, you know, we like live in different places. So it's so fun to be together. So thanks to the events team for putting it together. And thank you guys for coming. And here is Rachel Dry. Mave <laughs> <laughs> Higgins, everybody. Um, it is now my great, great pleasure to introduce to you um, a contributing writer to the New York Times, the author of the incredible book Shrill, that is going to yep, that is going to be available to you not just in book form but in television show form next year. Please join me in welcoming to New York and the New York Times stage, Lindy West. <laughs> My goodness, so happy to be here. So I'm gonna do a um, very ridiculous, uh, humorous PowerPoint for you <laughs> <laughs> about feminism, which is a really like a um, wildly popular genre, the fe uh, humorous feminist PowerPoint. Um, sort of loosely adapted from a column that I wrote here at the Times, which um, featured my favorite headline of all time, um, okay, it was something like, sure, this is a witch hunt. I'm a witch and I'm hunting you. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. I'm really proud of it. I tried to run that headline at Jezebel um, in like 2011, and my editor was like, whoa, too spicy, no. And then um, sort of uh, society decayed. <laughs> Enough, like, to the point where uh, Rachel was like, oh, yeah, sure, that's reasonable, yes. Um, okay, so, um, so here we go. Humorous PowerPoint. <laughs> this is, I, it's like the first slide is a real situation, and I'm, okay, here, we're just going to do it. Here we go. Okay, so a few months ago, I'm going to explain, I'm going to explain. So a few months ago, um, my husband was at a bar in Chicago. And someone had told him to check out this bar because it was like a cool dive bar run by queer people of color. And um, the night that he was there, there was a DJ and people were dancing, partying, having a good time. And my husband was sitting at the bar having a drink. And after a while, a guy came in and sat down next to him. White guy, maybe like late 40s, super standard, random uh, white guy, polo shirt, mustache. And I just want to say that... Um, as I was making this humorous feminist PowerPoint, I realized that um, you can't just steal people's images and use them for in your own work for profit. So um, I had to like improvise, and um, so I did a photo shoot. <laughs> I produced it, and um, spoiler alert, I starred in it. So this is my actual husband, and this is the the guy. We're gonna I'm gonna call him Larry. It's like his like Larry or Barry. I'm gonna call him Larry Berry. That's me playing the role of Larry Berry. Um, and I did this humorous PowerPoint once before and um, my mom was there and then afterwards she was like, who was, who was that guy? <laughs> it was me, mom. Also, I look exactly like dad, so I don't know why you're confused. Okay, so Larry Berry struck up a conversation with my husband. He asked him if he's having fun. And my husband was like, yeah, yeah, this is a fun bar. You know, people are dancing, seems pretty cool. And then Larry Berry got a really sad look on his face and he said, yeah, this is one of my favorite songs. I wish I was dancing right now. So my husband said, like you do, as you would, well, uh, why don't you go dance? And Larry Berry said, I'm not allowed to dance. So my husband was obviously confused. There didn't seem to be any restrictions on who was or was not allowed to dance. So he said, Larry Berry, why are you not allowed to dance? And then Larry Berry told his tragic tale. Well, <laughs> I can't believe. Okay. Um, Larry Berry was like, well, two nights ago I came to this bar. Um, and I come here all the time because it's the closest bar to my house. And uh, they were having a dance night, and I love to dance. So I went out on the dance floor, and I, there were some people out there dancing, so I just started dancing with this girl. And then she said, I don't really want to dance with you. And then her friend got all weird about it. So now I guess I'm not allowed to dance. <laughs> okay, can you believe that? He's not allowed to dance. That's what it's come to. This is what the PC police have done to us. <laughs> well, sorry if I don't want to live in a world where straight white men in their 40s with mustaches can't go to the queer POC dance night and non-consensually grind on lesbians they don't know without their friends getting all weird about it. <laughs> so my husband said, I'm pretty sure if you just go out there and dance and don't touch anyone, you'll be fine. And uh, Larry Berry thought, hmm, don't touch anyone. What's that? <laughs> but he decided to go for it. And as he got up from the bar, he looked at my husband and he, he said, man to man, if something goes wrong, will you back me up? And my husband said, if something goes wrong, you will look over here and you will find that this chair is empty and you will never see me again because I don't know you. So, this modern fable, The Ballad of Larry Berry, <laughs> so stupid, um, tells us quite a bit about our current moment in history. It seems that a lot of men, not all men, uh, are confused 
uh, mistaking being asked not to violate other people's sexual boundaries with being forbidden to participate in basic human activities such as dancing, <laughs> going to work, um, and telling jokes. So one thing you hear a lot when a man, particularly a man we all like, gets accused of something awful, is that the accusations are not real, but are in fact part of a baseless, bloodthirsty, politically motivated mass hysteria known as a witch hunt. So, and just like, this took like two seconds to compile. <laughs> like there's so many, so many of these. And I would also like to point out that that one is really old in the bottom <laughs> right corner. It's like really been going on. Okay, so, <laughs> so the term witch hunt um, is most commonly used to refer to the witch trials of early modern Europe and colonial America, during which an estimated 40 to 60,000 people were brutally tortured by being briefly ostracized at work and having a lot of people yell at them on social media. <laughs> oh, sorry, I read it wrong. Um, they were hanged, uh, beheaded, or burned at the stake but still very, very similar to the um, Me Too witch hunts. Very similar. So, as you can see, um, this is a painting or something of, um, of a colonial witch hunt. And um, for those of you who aren't art historians, um, I've annotated it to show you, okay, just how similar modern day witch hunts are to their historical counterparts. So, and normally, I, I wish I had a laser pointer, but so just, but so what we have here, we have the men who did nothing wrong, um, and they're being burned alive by, these are feminists, obviously. Um, and then this, the man in, the, here in the upper left, we have a, a man who did nothing wrong, who's being tormented by a harpy that represents how Sharon's butt looked in those pants. And like, sorry, Sharon, shouldn't have worn those pants if you didn't want a man to do nothing wrong to you. Um, let's see, so here, the, it's classic iconography in the background. We have a feminist murdering due process with a sword. Um, the court of a public opinion, AKA social media, does nothing about it. Um, this is free speech um, dying on the ground and no one cares. And then in this tower, these are two guys um, from Reddit trying to save the legacy of Brett Ratner, which is on fire. <laughs> And that's what a witch hunt is. Like, I think we all learned something. So, oh man. So I'm sympathetic to people who feel like they're being left behind in this new world. In a lot of ways, we all are. We're tearing down old systems and we haven't built new systems yet. And I understand that it's scary to suddenly face consequences for things that used to be socially acceptable. And I hear a lot of hand-wringing from men about how they're going to adapt. Won't it affect women's upward mobility if men are afraid to work with them? That has been said to me many times, um, in person to my face by real people. <laughs> like, well, I'm, I mean, uh, men aren't gonna hire women to work at their businesses if they're just gonna get accused of a doo doo boot. So, uh, how are people supposed to date and procreate? What if I get fired over a simple misunderstanding? So I've created a few tutorials to help ease the transition during this difficult time. Okay, um, tutorial number one, how to interact with your female coworkers without getting fired for sexually harassing them. Okay, um, step one, don't talk about genitals. I mean, we all, like, unless you work at like a genital-related job, <laughs> that's fair game. Maybe you are a piercer or a doctor, I don't know. Um, genital doctor, fine, okay. Um, okay, treat them like you treat your male coworkers when you're not talking to your male coworkers about genitals. <laughs> Which I know might be confusing. <laughs> okay, uh, step three is, uh, come on, you already know how to do this. You literally do it all the time. You don't talk about genitals like so much of the day. You are so good at it. Like, think about how you might conduct yourself if you were at your child's band recital, or um, if you were giving your sister a shoulder massage, or if you were being arrested. Could you refrain from talking about genitals? I think you could. I totally believe in you. Okay, step four. I would just do work when you're at work. 
how about that? How about we, how about, you know, you're all trapped in a building together. Like, these people are being sort of held hostage with you. Why are you making it worse? <laughs> They're forced to be around you. Okay, and step five, um, the most important step, come on, come on, <laughs> come on. Okay, seriously, come on. It's so easy. Okay, tutorial number two. This is um, an important one, how to date. Okay, step one. It's okay if you wanna take notes, you can take pictures, whatever. Do you wanna get coffee sometime? That's all, okay. So maybe you're like, oh, I'm interested in this person. Try, do you wanna get coffee sometime? Okay, right? I know, it seems advanced or like, could it, could it be misinterpreted? No, do you wanna get coffee sometime? But it only works if you follow step two. If they say no, then you go away. <laughs> and then you leave them alone. Okay? Step two is really important, and it's really hard for people. Okay, but it's, it's actually simple. If you, like, maybe you practice. Maybe there's like some sort of drills you could do with your friends, I don't know. <laughs> then step three, don't commit sexual assault. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess that one's hard. <laughs> I, uh, Okay, this one's really hard for people. Anyone's allowed to dump you at any time. Just because someone like was, your, even if you're, you were married to them, um, you, they can just not, they don't have to be with you anymore because we're all um, autonomous uh, beings with free will. So, okay? Um, and get over it. So then once it's done, then you get over it and then you go on and do the rest of your life uh, without that person. And you do other stuff and you don't own them and they get to go do other stuff too. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so now, okay, so, I feel like, like, <laughs> misunderstanding has really been um, misappropriated lately, and a lot of people are using the word misunderstanding incorrectly, um, but some things really are misunderstandings, and so um, they're real, you know? But some people are confused about what constitutes a misunderstanding and what constitutes being horrible. So, I have some examples. So, a misunderstanding. Um, if you said to your coworker, hey, I have that toner you've been looking for, but they thought you said, um, hey, I have that boner you've been looking for, that would be a misunderstanding. Bonafide misunderstanding, okay. Okay, or, if you said, I like your office chair, but they are a silly goose, and they thought you said, I like your orifice hair. <laughs> Legit misunderstanding. It's like, that is totally defensible. Okay, you did nothing wrong. Okay. Now, here are some examples of things that are not misunderstandings. Okay, when you wanna touch Jennifer's butt, so you just do it. <laughs> No, that does not count. Okay, when your phone number is blocked, so you get a new phone number, so you can keep texting. No. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, oh, uh, when you drink a thousand beers at a house party and you force a terrified fifteen-year-old girl into a bedroom and you push her on a bed and you press your body on top of her so she can't move and you try to rip her clothes off and when she tries to scream for help you clamp your hand over her mouth so tightly she thinks you might accidentally suffocate her and the whole time you're laughing and laughing with your friend as though this girl is just a thing for you to use because you own the world. That's not a misunderstanding. That's a bad thing that you did. All right. So. I mean, it seems pretty simple, right? Okay, so I wanna return to my opening anecdote about Larry Berry, who wasn't allowed to dance. <laughs> now, for the purpose of a cleaner narrative flow, I considered ch just changing the story and saying that it was me who had the encounter with Larry Berry at the bar, uh, instead of like relaying it <laughs> secondhand through my husband, just because it would make for better storytelling. But then I realized that the story doesn't work with me sitting at the bar because that Larry Berry would never say that to me. The frustration that Larry Berry expressed to my husband and not being allowed to dance anymore was contingent on the assumption of a shared understanding, a collective lamentation between men. 
He wasn't trying to complain to my husband. He was trying to commiserate with him uh, about the loss of power and freedom, of no longer being the one who makes the rules, of no longer having the benefit of the doubt in every interaction. And this whole presidency, this whole era in history is a backlash to progress that we fought for. It's a panicked response to something as simple as marginalized people telling the truth about what's happened to them. I don't know what's gonna happen with the Supreme Court and the future of democracy and the survival of the human race on Earth. Um, but I do know that yesterday, I got to watch Brett Kavanaugh and Lindsey Graham scream and cry like little babies. <laughs> little fucking baby boys. And I want you to remember, no matter what happens, that we did that. Uh, to some extent, to a large extent, they still control our futures, but they're fucking terrified, and they should be. Thank you. Caitlin. Um, wonderful. Well, here we are. We wanted to um, all be together at the same time. And I wanted to ask if Larry Barrier was single. <laughs> <laughs> I, definitely. 100%. I wanted you all to be able to hear the answer. Um, I just, we're going to have a little chat, and then we definitely want um, you to be able to ask questions too. So mm -hmm. the first thing we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about politics. Obviously, everything is political, but specifically, um, it's an interesting year to be thinking about it. There are a lot of women running for office, and a, a lot of people refer to it as a women's wave. Will there be a women's wave to, in response to Trump? And, and especially in the past couple months, people have been comparing it to 1992, which was the year of the woman. We got that one year. Um, <laughs> And so we're just, we're just going to do a quick, a quick game uh, with, with um, I'm going to go, go start with me and then go down the um, Is this uh, from a news report in 2018 or 1992? Okay. 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 Year of the woman or this? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. We can come up with a better name for it. Okay. <clears throat> When voters demanded change, there were large numbers of women ready and eager to make their moves. This year? No. <laughs> that's, that's from October 1982. Oh, wait, I wrote that in a piece. No. <laughs> <laughs> I cut it out. Um, that's from a story about um, Diane Feinstein and Barbara Boxer. It's called yeah. Feinstein and Boxer Steal the Show. And it was a story about, look at these two women running for office. Wow. Um, OK, Caitlin. <clears throat> Candidates from both sides of the aisle say they've encountered voters who say they are relieved to see more women on the ballot, particularly in light of high-profile sexual harassment scandals that have rocked Congress and private industry. Oh, I'm going to go counterintuitive and say 92. See, she wasn't sure. Could it have been 1982 <laughs> when there were scandals <laughs> rocking Congress or private industry? Or today, it's really um, just like a, a delight that... that continues to grow. That is from uh, March 5th, 2018. Mm -hmm. okay. A story in the Dallas Morning News. So, so um, maybe it was better in 1982. Okay. Um, Women are so bad at quizzes. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a quote. <clears throat> It's still a men's club. Until they get more women involved, they're not going to understand. Maybe if a man becomes a woman and then gets politically involved, they will begin to understand a little. Then this person went on. I would have to see a woman in a big position, like vice president, she said. That's what it would take. Was that from 1992 or 2008? I mean, that has to be 1992. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's from a story, the headline, Women Turn Anger into Political Capital, from July 15, 1992 when they were dreaming about the vice presidency. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I feel like that was a little bit hard, um, the first one, and, and you are um, Irish, and I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to 
so perhaps not as intimately familiar with American politics, so I, I do want... Um, and I don't have a vote. <laughs> All I can do is boo. <laughs> <laughs> That's one part of the equation. Okay, so um, here, is this from 1992 or, or 2018? Okay. The year's top break song, not surprisingly, it was Boys to Men's End of the Road. <laughs> <laughs> On my Spotify playlist? <laughs> um, 92. She got it! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got it, okay. Um, <clears throat> one more for each of you. Um, of, of equal level of dis difficulty, Caitlin. Okay. This, this was contained in a news report um, in one of these years. And then there's a booth. Oh, oh God. <laughs> um, 2018. Uh -huh. Such a disgusting <laughs> That's word. where we are. Mm -hmm. um, OK. But uh, last one, Lindy. It's the food that we have been hungry for. This is the moment for women to become a permanent part of leadership in this country. Mm, I mean. 2018? Yeah. Oh, it's nice that we're not already. <laughs> we start, mm. not. I thought it was a little inspiring. No, it is. It is. I, it's <laughs> just like very real. <laughs> we're not a permanent part of leadership. True. Um, so uh, another question I was uh, curious about is like if there were to be um, a national com or international conversation about any element of your high school yearbook, what would you find it sort of the most traumatic <laughs> or embarrassing to relive? <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> I mean, just like my face <laughs> and my whole hair and outfit. Um, oh God, I don't know. Um, let's see, what was in my yearbook? I was like such a dork, there was nothing scandalous. I, I'll, so just to like be vulnerable first, I used a, um, a quote about the importance of friendship from Montaigne. <laughs> that I emailed my father to ask, what are some philosophers who had good quotes about friendship? <laughs> because, I wanted to project a certain air. Okay, that's adorable. <laughs> but is, it, is adorable <laughs> the word we would use? Well, let me tell just you. now that I've like um, <laughs> let me shared. Tell you what, yeah. what my my the quote that I used was um, from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been from the Bogus. The Montaigne actually. of our time. Really. <laughs> actually, it might have been from the Bogus Journey. It was from one of the two, and the quote was. Well, the, the quote was, um, you and I have witnessed many things, but nothing as bodacious as what just happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good quote. Yeah. yeah, except then I was self-conscious about it because mm. it was more that I wanted to use a Bill and Ted quote, and then I was like, this implies that I like loved high school. <laughs> like, yeah. And I wanted to like not be that dork, mm -hmm. um, and I felt slightly humiliated by like that I looked too, like, too into it. Mm. But it's still, because my friend Hester used... Um, uh, things are going to start happening to me now from the jerk. Mm. And we like fought over who was going to get which one, and I was mad that she got the better one. <laughs> we didn't have yearbooks, but I remember like signing each other's journals, and everyone had to say like which teacher they w w fancied the Ooh, most. No. Which is definitely not, you know. <laughs> that's not right. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> it's not, it's not yeah. right. <laughs> And, and, and we only had... So who did you put? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's in prison. <laughs> <laughs> we had a scandal where the principal was dating the head cheerleader when I was oh, in high school. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It was very exciting. Oh, my God. But also, it was dating? Like, like, yeah, like, <laughs> we're dating. It, 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 his wife found out because he, oh. like, b he put her on his insurance. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh my, because you can get injured from Shirley yeah. yeah. But like she was 18, so it was, people were like, well, I guess it's fine. <laughs> Caitlin, nothing, there's nothing embarrassing. No, there was a of. bunch of embarrassing stuff. Um, I went to like a really artsy school that only had like 20 students, a great, everybody was very pretentious. Um, I so my, I, and I, I was photo editor for yearbook. Um, and I did nothing in that position. I just kind of like glared at people and then they never actually did anything for me. And I'm trying to remember, editing. I think for my own thing, I, I was very um, self-dramatizing. So I think I like 
took like a, a, a baby picture of myself and kind of made like a memorial page, like as if I had passed away. Kind of <laughs> <way>. <laughs> like, um, with a lot of really kind of, you know, self-aggrandizing quotes. And then I was also a uh, graduation speaker. I was valedictorian and I gave a speech about how uh, I was slowly drowning there in that, in that voice. <laughs> which I felt really proud of and looking back and I'm like, what a bitchy thing to do with the rest of this auditorium <laughs> just like listening to me talk about this. Anyway, and I'm leaving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, a public apology to like the 25 other families there who just wanted to like <laughs> celebrate their kids graduating from high school. They're actually, they're here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing this. Cause I, I, I did want to return briefly to the political theme. Like I've been thinking about this a lot when we think about what coverage we want to do and, and how we want to talk to people now before November, like when, when people talk, when people use the phrase women voters, what, what kind of, I don't know how to set this up without telling you what I think, but <laughs> what do you, does that feel like a useful phrase at this moment? Women voters or women candidates or how, how do we reach women? Is that, does that feel like a useful thing to be talking about? Not like in this moment, because this is useful, but like <laughs> in, you know, broadly. Well, I think, I think it is. Because I think like they, you know, women were ignored for longer than men were and like it's good if there if people are concerned with women vote, surely. Mm -hmm. I mean it's like yes and no. It's like I think like yeah, that's the reality. And I think the more that um, you know, any marginalized group of people um, is conscious that as a collective they have power, mm. um, you know, that the more progress you can achieve. Um, but at the same time, it's very alienating. Like, it's not like women are a small minority. Mm -hmm. it's, we're very large. There are men, very many. We're, Is I mean, it, uh, over The world over, there's more women, but I don't know about the states. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I mean, you know, yeah. there might as well be. There's, it, it's. Um, we're better. Uh, it's like, so it's, it's very, it's strange. <laughs> it, it really reinforces that idea that like men are people and then women are sort of, um, you know, or defective better. men, or <laughs> 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 or like this sort of special other strange thing. Um, so I don't know. I kind of go. I'm of two minds about it. Yeah, I don't. I I am of two minds as well because, you know, the only way that you start to solve problems is to like identify and name things. So I think it's helpful in that way. But it is a really flattening term, right? You know, like, which women are we talking about? Are we talking about women who have a lot of money? Are we talking about women who are working class? Are we talking about black women? Are we talking about Asian women? Are we talking about immigrant women? All of those things affect how you are going to look at politics and are often actually at odds with each other or can be in our current political landscape. So, you know, I think it's a good place to start. And I think as long as we sort of deepen the I think a lot of times when people say women voters, it can feel like someone is shouting like women voters to you when you're trying to like bring up other things, you know? Um, so I think as much as you can use that to actually start a conversation about um, where our different identities are gonna be at odds, um, it's helpful. Um, looking ahead, not to November, but to October 31st, what um, <laughs> like, topical Halloween costume are you most <laughs> concerned someone is gonna attempt? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Do you have an answer for this? Yes. Um, no, I'm asking the question. <laughs> no, I, I mean like, so I told you Montaigne, like I always tried to like outsmart the Halloween spirit, so I don't know, like um, I, I don't have a good answer. Well, I mean, I could talk about something bad. that's really mean, which was when I was younger, I was always like, I'm going to go as Monica Lewinsky because like I look a bit like her. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was like such a funny, would be such a funny thing to do. And like that my friend would be Linda Tripp and I'd like do the whole dress and everything. Wait, in Cove, people would, it would be present and people would know. Like in Ireland, yeah. that was a huge story. <laughs> 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 and I was only like, I don't know when, when it was, really but like, I was young, like I was really young and I was just like, you know, scandalized and I never thought it through or anything. But I'm not sure I would have recognized the Linda Tripp costume. You no, but she would be with, you know, oh, with she'd me. Be with you. Okay, she'd be with you, okay. The joke was like, she'd be there being like, <gasps> you know, it was really mean. Yeah. It was, it was like so mean and I didn't have a clue. 
And like, I really think I thought that up until probably like, I never did it, only through laziness, not through like some political <laughs> awakening. <laughs> But now when I think of it, I'm like, Jesus Christ, like a good thing is that I have now read Monica Lewinsky's work and mm. I've like thought things through and educated myself a bit more. But that was like a really main thing that I yeah. thought was mm -hmm. fine before. Mm -hmm. But this year. <laughs> <laughs> Monica Lewinsky. You can, that can be your answer. I was so, going to yeah. the Monica Lewinsky of today. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, you really, I don't want to say like the worst things that I could think of. Well, I'll say, okay, Sad. so this is, yeah. I I I'd love to see like a sexy, crying Lindsey Graham. <laughs> 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 or like Orrin Hatch <laughs> with a boner being, you know, like that thing that he said was so disgusting. Mm -hmm. Did you get that where he was like, she's a nice looking lady. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was, yeah. what is wrong with you? They're, I mean, they're broken. <laughs> something has something. They have a disease yeah. in their brains. Like something has gone wrong. Um, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to. We're on the holiday part. I know. Yeah. I know. Sorry. Um, I was gonna say like free idea from Lindy, but maybe just use one of them. <laughs> <laughs> or use your discretion. Probably I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, never mind. No, nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Or oh, um, yeah. I mean. Halloween is so weird, right? Like, I always really loved Halloween, and then, um, you know, people take Halloween too far, and then it just gets sad and, like, really uh, uncomfortable for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I am all for, you know, like, the, the most innocuous, pun-based, really annoying costumes, kind of, that mm. I just think were really stupid, but bring those back, because we don't have any. Bring those back. Like, just wear la lingerie and be like, it's a Freudian slip. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> bullshit. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> um, I, I, saw, I, got such, I saw such mixed responses to the sexy Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it was like, I mean, I, my social media, like, my Facebook is just basically only feminist screaming feminists mm -hmm. so and like half of them were like what this is um obviously a, a nightmare and then some of them were like this is great i'm gonna do it like <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to think of an idea like i asked the question i didn't have an idea so like, sometimes you just need yeah <laughs> like i mean it was like some of them were like i'm going to reclaim this mm -hmm. um very insulting horrifying uh mm -hmm. i don't know so um, you decide <laughs> well, uh, so just in just a minute, we'll, we'll take your questions, but I, I should have started with this, and I'm sorry to, to, I didn't, but like, how are you feeling? In general, how would you characterize <laughs> your feeling? <laughs> and is there, is, I guess what I'm asking is, is there like an appropriate way to answer that question? Because when I get the question, usually I just go, <laughs> <laughs> so can I steal a better answer? Like, how, how are you feeling in this moment? Um, I've been like, keeping really busy this week and that's helpful and I've also been like interviewing just kind of by chance so it's not like a my theory or method but like I, I was interviewing immigrant lawyers for a piece I'm working on and that's been really bolstering and good they happen to all be women they happen to all be like extremely busy at the moment uh working for like I like talked to this one girl who's I say girl, she's like 28 or something, but um, she has like 66 children, clients who are looking for asylum. And I was like, uh, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And she was like, you know, I'm good. I go to these morning raves. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like, I don't know, there's like some organization that does like a rave twice a month or something. No, yeah, no, I know. And I was like, okay, because that's like my nightmare. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm tempering what's happening with what's also happening, which is like, I think putting my attention on these people and I'm sure lots of people in the audience who are going about their jobs, which are help doing helpful things and working against the bigger narrative that like you probably have to write about every day, write and think about. And um, so I think placing my attention on uh, people and things that are helpful and doing good is definitely like helping me. So that's, so that's how I'm doing. Morning raves. 
<laughs> morning, babe, morning, babe. Morning. No, I would never, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> but it was brilliant because she's definitely her. And then again, her clients are even having an even harder time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was good to talk to her. Um, yeah, I sort of made a pact with myself not to watch any of the news in real time. Because um, I think when you watch it in real time, you have kind of like the illusion that you're in control somehow. And we're not in control. So just like letting go of that part of it. You know, if I'm late knowing information by six hours, it actually is not that big a deal. It's totally fine. Um, and so I say that, but like I spent this morning like, uh, arguing on Twitter with someone in a friend's mentions, a man who I will never meet and do not know. Um, and uh, I call them some pretty shitty names, so don't search for that when you're on Twitter. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so yeah, it's like it's back and forth. Um, but I've been trying to, yeah, see, stay as much in contact with um, actual pe people, have as many actual conversations. Mm -hmm as possible. Um, this afternoon, I actually got to interview this woman. Uh, I'm writing a piece right now about uh, the network of black women doulas that have uh, sprung up to respond to the really kind of horrifying statistics around black women in birth in the US. Wow. Oh, yeah, clap for the doulas. <laughs> yeah, they're doing really great work. And so I talked with this woman today, and she was telling me about um, helping a woman last week give birth and they were walking along the woman's, she was giving, she's doing a home birth and they were walking along the woman's street in Crown Heights and all of the um, older aunties on the street were all out on the stoop because it was a nice day and they saw them walking to um, uh, get through the labor and they all started cheering and applauding this woman uh -huh. and being like, you can do it, you can do it. it was, I like burst into tears when I was like doing this interview, it was not very professional. Mm -hmm. um, but like stuff like that is, uh, is kind of the stuff that I'm trying to focus on. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, 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 yesterday I watched the, I watched um, Dr. Ford's statement, and then as soon as I started asking her questions, I had a panic attack and I had to turn it off. Mm -hmm. um, I, like, it, it just, I'm, I'm really, really, um, like, uh, wildly angry. It, I was just, I just got so angry that um, that these people feel like they're entitled to this level of intrusive um, questioning and this information, and that we're expected to just. I don't know. I, I just got. I'm very angry. Um, <laughs> very, very angry um, all the time. Um, but I also, I weirdly don't feel um, despair right now. I feel like I've never seen every single person that I know this angry mm -hmm. all at once. And like, I, I don't know, like, I, and the way that the men at the hearing behaved, and I've been watching clips, like I've been sort of just catching up piece by piece when I can stomach it. I mean, there, I've never seen anything like that in my life, the way that like they were screaming and literally crying. I, I mean, and, I, and, and the thing with, I, I, I can't even talk about it. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And it feels like, even if it feels like a, a shift in a bad direction, it's still like movement and movement means that movement is possible. Like something about it is like weirdly galvanizing and hopeful for me. Like I just feel like, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, you guys, yeah, you, everything's going great for you guys, clearly, and you're definitely gonna keep a tight hold on the nation, absolutely. <laughs> really flooding everyone with confidence with this <laughs> behavior. Like, there's something about it where I'm just like, I, it can't actually hold forever, and I don't know what's mm -hmm, gonna happen, yeah. and probably it will be bad, um, but maybe it will, maybe maybe it will fall apart in a direction that we can actually harness and rebuild, I don't know. Um, but mostly, I'm off Twitter. I quit Twitter like, I don't know, two years ago. It's great. And I mean, not that everyone should quit Twitter. I just love, I love not being on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, I, um, I just really, all I do is watch the Food Network. <laughs> um, because it's 
<laughs> I find it very soothing. I watch a lot of, like even stuff that's like the, the worst of the Food Network is what I crave. Mm -hmm. Like Guy's Grocery Games, I can't stop watching it. Because <laughs> it's just like the, the most pointless, like bad, very bad, like the, trash. A lot I don't know. Of, a lot of tools. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot there, going on. on. There's like wacky sound effects. <laughs> like, and you, it's just sort of, I, I put my, my whole face into it and I just soak in there. Um, I, I do want to make sure um, that if people have any like follow up questions about grocery games or <laughs> I have opinion. anything else, um, that you do get a chance to talk. So uh, we'll open the floor for, for um, a handful of, of questions. Uh, I think we're there. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. So I got these two. Um, things when I walked in, the truth is hard, and um, she said, and I thought that it empowered me to speak some truth. I feel like what has happened, and with Dr. Ford standing up, it was a stance for anyone who's ever been a victim, and I found it, I found it interesting that we couldn't just walk in here and talk about it that we had to like make jokes and, and I found it interesting that it's so uncomfortable to us. And I, yesterday I found my reaction interesting where when he started crying, I started feeling bad for him and for his reputation. Um, and I, I didn't allow myself to feel Dr. Ford's pain mm -hmm. because it was too close to home. You know, the feeling of being somewhere and just in your mind thinking you might get raped right now. That, that feeling is a real physical feeling that so many people can identify with. And we try to shut it down and we have shame about our feelings. Um, like just sharing this, I'm like shaking, you know, because it is, it's a real, like what she did standing up for, for to put her life at risk is so powerful. And I really think that it's so painful for us to talk about, to feel her pain. And I think we need to talk more and share how we feel and put our darkest emotions into the, into the light because we're so disconnected and we're so numb to people's pain in the, in the history of, of this country and of many countries. And we're so numb to it because it hurts and we, we'd rather not feel it. We'd rather not cry I, right now. I do really appreciate you, you sharing that, and and um and I just I'm going to be conscious of other people's yeah, I will time. And I, I so in my role in the opinion section, we're doing a lot of that. You know, a great. I'm not. It's not about you. It's more. I'm since this is the New York Times. Sure. You, the New York Times has a role for free speech. Sure. And for to inspire and empower women. So as a woman to woman, what I'm just inviting everyone to do is let's create spaces where we could actually share as opposed to continue to numb. And I hope the New York Times can, can support us in doing that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, my question changed. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I dressed up. Um, well, all of you were just fantastic. Thank you so much for the wonderful um, conversations sure. that you and, and the humor that you brought to the room. Um, I'm reflecting on my own Halloween costume where I dressed up as binders full of women uh, during the Mitt Romney campaign. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and it was sexy. It was a sexy um, binders full of women um, because that's what's expected So uh, of Halloween. Uh, and I hear what you're saying about the, I guess like humor is a way of, of coping with these difficult circumstances and also engaging people in larger conversations. Um, these are things that people push away and I just commend you for engaging us and inspiring us all to think on a day that's particularly hard. Um, so I don't Do you have particularly question? have a question mm -hmm. anymore. Um, and I just wanted to say um, thank you. And I guess, Caitlin, my question to you more specifically is when you were telling your story um, about growing up in Connecticut you mentioned a white supremacist cell, and everyone laughed. And I was like, oh, that like mm -hmm. made me cringe. And I was just wondering, like, how do you deal with those reactions that you probably hear often, um, despite trying to make light of really difficult circumstances? 
Um, I mean, I think there's, a, I am a big fan of uncomfortable jokes and really dark jokes. I mean, I wrote a novel about a black family that moves to an all white town in the Western Massachusetts to uh, take part in an experiment where they're raising a chimpanzee. <laughs> so I'm, uh, my professional life is built on awkward laughter like that. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think what both of, both kind of people are saying, the, the two comments are kind of talking about is this place of laughter and sort of what this means. And I think the way that I always think about it is that place of laughter uh, is, we think of it as sort of like a common reaction. But in fact, people are entering that space from very different spaces. Some people are entering that from um, being uncomfortable and not knowing what to do. Um, some people are entering that from knowing a history or story very, very well and knowing the sadness of so much of our history in this country. Um, and at a certain point, when you study the history of women in this country or the history of uh, black people or poor people, the absurdity just gets so much that you just, I mean, my reaction is just like, what, what the fuck, I just have to laugh. Like, my sister told me the other day, we were just having this conversation back and forth, and she was like, oh, did you know there was a black couple on the Titanic? And I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, yeah, there was this black couple, and they were like, they really wanted to be on the Titanic, they wanted to be the first black people on the Titanic, like, black people tried to raise money for them, and they said no, they were gonna like, do their own boat straps, so they like, sacrifice all their money, and they got on the Titanic, and I was like, oh my God, that's horrible, I was like, did they die? And she started laughing at me, and she was like, come on, Caitlin, what the fuck, you know how the story goes? She was like, what do you think? And, um, and I cried a little bit, and then I laughed really hard at myself for being so naive, and then I was like, you know what, this is horrible and funny, and what a crazy metaphor for our current time, like so many of us are trying to integrate the Titanic when maybe we should not be in this yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, maybe we should be divesting and kind of thinking of building other spaces. And so when I think about those reactions, I think about what laughter can kind of push us to, to think about and to get there, while also knowing that there are certain conversations where I, am, where I am entering in, where I am entering from deep pain, and I am not ready to be at that place of laughing yet. So I think, Whenever sort of I'm talking about that, I'm, I am very cognizant and very aware that everybody in the room is coming at it from, a, a, from very different angles. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not gonna stop me from making jokes that I find funny even when they land very flat for a whole audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, it's uh, so great to be here and hear from all of you. I'm, I'm really a big fan of all of yours. Um, even though the one of you that I don't know, so it's great to meet you. Question for Lindy. I am so looking forward to Shrill coming out, and I wondered what it's like to see someone portray you on camera. Um, it's very strange. Um, uh, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful and terrible. It's like, it's totally surreal. So for context, um, I wrote a memoir in 2016, and it got, um, uh, we we pitched it as a TV show and we just finished shooting it for Hulu. It'll come out next year, um, and it's um, it's I mean totally a dream come true. I was I'm an executive producer. I was on the I, I wrote the show, um, so I was deeply involved. But it's still weird. Like there's still like um, it becomes very real once you go to shoot it, and there's like a guy pretending to be your dad <laughs> who is dead mm -hmm. and like saying stuff that your dad used to say to you. And then, you know, in the writer's room, we're like, oh, what season should we have the dad die? Like, I mean, it's very, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's bizarre and, like, kind of traumatizing, but also your dream is coming true, and it's also, like, beautiful and magical. And so, I don't know, it's, I, I literally just, we finished shooting, like, 10 days ago, and I have not um, recovered. I don't know what's <laughs> what going on. Um, but it's, I mean, it's incredible. I'm really proud of it. Um, and it's, like, you know, it, it the show touches on all the stuff that I write about all the time, like, you know, like, um, especially um, body image and and these things that um, I never shut up about. And to the point where they're kind of um, so close to me that I, they don't uh, re really, I don't they, don't, they don't resonate the same way anymore. And then going and making this show and the way that like the crew and the extras and everyone involved in the project was so moved by it made me feel like, oh yeah, this, these, a lot of these ideas are still really new to people and really um, powerful, and I, I'm so, I just feel so grateful that I 
that we get to put this show out, and I, I, I'm really excited for you to see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am aware of, of our time, so just time for the one more. Thank okay. you very much. Sorry. Good evening. I'll be really quick. I'm a huge fan of all of you, so thank you for doing this tonight. I have a question about male allies and how to talk to them to really get the picture. I'm very fortunate to work with uh, some men who've been great mentors and producers and helpful in my career, but talking today about this week, um, one of them was like, well, I'm just worried about the unintended consequences about all these sorts of uh, things like are politicians going to be using women's stories as, uh, you know, w pol political weapons. Um, and I think that's a very fortunate place to be, to worry about unintended consequences while the rest of us are still trying to get actual consequences for what's done to us. So I understand what he's saying, but I still think like they don't get the picture and they're one step ahead. So how do we address that to get our allies to really stand by us? I mean, one quick thing that I often say is like, I see a lot of uh, men saying, oh, my, if this was my daughter or if this was my girlfriend, but then if you just remind them like, or if it was you, like, so it doesn't have to be removed. And that's helpful, because so, like maybe they, didn't, they just didn't think of that before. That's one quick thing that I sometimes try. That's really good. I mean, I, I oftentimes try to also turn the question back around, which is like, um, if instead of going down sort of like the crazy rabbit hole of like dystopian consequences, like what are what is an actual consequence that you could think of that would be appropriate to this? Um, which is an impossible question to answer. And I think the point is that that is an impossible question to answer. We live in a society that can't think of anything besides intense punishment um, in response to any small infraction. Um, so having people try to rethink what that might look like um, and actually like realize that there's no right answer to that question. There's no possible way to have an answer to that question. Um, and all the answers you're gonna come up with are horribly wrong um, is a way to kind of start having the conversation. And I think another good question is, um, okay, well, what if we don't do this? You know what I mean? Like what's the alternative to doing this? Like you want people to go back to being silent and holding pain inside, never talking about it, never getting any justice, never even just being able to speak honestly about their experiences and what is how they've been exploited or abused. I mean, uh, to me, it's just like the, the question of what about unintended consequences, I, I don't, it, it's like almost irrelevant because it's the thing has to happen. So yeah, yeah we have to figure out how to deal with uh, unintended consequences and, and you know, obviously like mitigate um, collateral damage or all the ways people love to talk about this. Um, but it's, it's not optional. You know, this sort of reckoning is not optional um, because the alternative is, is uh, generations of trauma. Generations of trauma. <laughs> Your exactly. mom not loving you because she's like still dealing with her old traumatic whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Your sorry. mom. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Your mom's That's what I was looking yeah. for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you tell me, you say to me that what you want is to not do this and to have, have you know, people who've been victimized go back to, to that, you know? I, I don't know. I, I just don't see... That, that always feels like a panic response, like someone that doesn't actually want to deal with... Think about it. Or mm -hmm. Yeah, or who thinks that they're going to get in trouble or who, you know, Think. doesn't... I don't know. It's like, let's... How about we deal with the actual harm that's been done before we start worrying about people who might be harmed by harm being, uh, you know... Um, uh, yeah, maybe we can get him with these with PowerPoint, that. and that would also yeah. help if we we just can yeah, syndicate that on a streaming service. I feel like that actually will answer a lot of those questions. Um, so I, we are going to um, begin the process of wrapping up here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. This was the first time we did anything like this, um, and. Uh, it was such a pleasure to share it with these incredible writers and thinkers, as Lindy West, Caitlin Greenish, Maeve Higgins. Please buy their work. You can find their work in the New York Times opinion section, and um, hopefully many more vibrant voices like theirs. And please come back if we do it again. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Thanks, night. Thanks, everyone.